All right, welcome everyone. My name is Ryan Susky. I'm Director of Programs over at the Ohio Center for Law-Related Education, and we're here today for the Unit 4 hearing of the National Invitational. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to have the judges go to introduce themselves, followed by the students. The process we're going to follow today is, of course, a four-minute opening statement, and then eight minutes of follow-up questions from the judges. Now, during the hearing itself, I'm going to have my microphone muted, but I will be holding up your time signals. So I do recommend that you go ahead and put your setting on gallery view so that you will see my time signals, your fellow students, and of course, your judges as they ask you questions. With that, uh, I will go ahead and hand things over to the judges to begin the introductions. Okay, well, welcome St. Richards and uh, glad to see you here. Uh, as, as Ryan suggested, we will introduce ourselves, have you introduce yourself and your teacher and then we'll turn uh, to the business at hand. My name is uh, Joe Stewart. I teach in the political science department at Clemson University in, in South Carolina been involved in the program for a number of years. Uh, really great program, and I appreciate the efforts that you and your teacher have put into this. Relax, we're gonna have fun, and we're gonna learn from you today about the Constitution. Diana, you're muted. Hi, everyone. Congratulations on making it to the National Invitational. I'm Diana Owen. I'm a professor of political science at Georgetown University. Good morning, I'm Deshaun Whitaker, we the people teacher at Charles County Public Schools in Maryland. Okay, please introduce yourselves and your teacher. Hello, I'm Thalia Burtis. My name is Daniel George. I'm Marianne Pace. I'm KK Sabo and our teacher is Mrs. Neal. Good to see you again, Mrs. Neal. Okay. Um, well, we're going to look at question one in unit four today. And because Ryan is, is recording this, I'm sure it will soon go viral. So I wanna make sure we, uh, we read the question so everyone will know what we're talking about. An American historian claims that the ratification debates were one of the greatest and most probing public debates in American history. Do you agree or disagree? Why? What evidence can you offer to support your response? Evaluate the major arguments the Federalists advanced in support of the ratification of the Constitution. Evaluate the major arguments the Anti-Federalists put forth in opposition to the ratification of the Constitution. Why did a Bill of Rights become a focal point for both the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists? You may begin. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Though the founding of the Republic was a light at the end of the dark tunnel that was British rule, the light began to quiver and dim as the ratification debates raged on at the Philadelphia Convention with no end in sight. The outcome of this debate was to decide the future of the United States. With its impact rippling through time all the way to the 21st century, it is safe to say that the debate was one of the most important in American history. Regardless, the Constitution still had to be ratified and a Federalist and Anti-Federalist remained fiercely divided. The Federalists were adamant that the Constitution be passed. They feared that without it, the United States wouldn't last much longer. Madison argued in Federalist 39 that the values of Republicanism aligned with the pillars of the Constitution. Republicanism is a government made up of representatives given power from the people. This is what the Constitution provided. The Federalists believed that they had created a strong national government that preserved freedom. By dividing government into three branches, each with checks on the other, they believed that no one person or department could assume too much power. Since the national government had enumerated powers and reserved all other powers to the states, it would act in the interest of the nation and not interfere with the people's personal rights. Federalism, according to Madison, was a double security to the rights of the people. Although the opponents of the Constitution worried that the new nation would be too large and diverse for a republic, the Federalists argued the opposite. Madison believed that there would be too ma so many voices in the new government that no faction would be dominant. The Anti-Federalists immediately objected to the Federalist propositions and spoke their minds accordingly. They believed that if the Constitution were ratified, the nation would face problems that were arguably worse than under the Articles. A strong executive branch, they warned, could become a monarchy. Another key objection, the national government would have more power than the state governments, 
which would lead to the destruction of the state governments as a whole. Additionally, they thought that the power to tax citizens and raise and keep an army during peacetime could be used to suppress the people. Pointing specifically to the necessary and proper cause, Brutus number one claimed that the new constitution would give the government absolute and uncontrollable power, legislative, executive, and judicial, which with respect to every object to which it extends. This tug of war of equally matched foes would have likely continued on, but the Federalists knew the importance of this document. Although both Hamilton and Madison didn't think a Bill of Rights was needed, they agreed to a compromise to ensure ratification. As soon as the Constitution took effect, the new Congress would approve amendments listing the rights of the people and the states. The first 10 amendments, collectively known as the Bill of Rights, would protect freedom of conscience, the right to bear arms, trial by jury, and protection of private property, just to name a few. The Ninth Amendment would make clear the, that citizens have additional rights beyond those explicitly listed, and the Tenth would stress the important role of states in the federal system. The Compromise was a turning point in the ratification debate. With this promise, the Anti-Federalists were satisfied for the most part, and state support for ratification grew. The argument reached its conclusion in 1788 with the approval of New Hampshire the last of the necessary nine states. The Congress met, the new Congress met in March of 1789 and immediately got to work writing and debating amendments. Though torturous and full of upsets and violent shifts, the document had made it to the end of its journey and went on to serve as the building block for our society as we know it today. As the future progresses, we as a group think that the same document created more than 200 years ago will continue to be just as effective as it was then. Therefore, we conclude that the ratification debate with all its struggles will go down as one of the greatest public debates in American history. We have finished our disquisition and are ready for your questions. Thank you. Enjoyed your, your presentation. Uh, you mentioned that one of the, the debates between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists had to do with executive powers and how much strength should be in the executive. Uh, can you talk about the extent to which we continue to debate that and, and do, do we have evidence about which side was correct on that? Executive power is still extremely controversial today, especially recently as um, Joe Biden has begun to um, sign multiple executive orders. And I do not believe there's evidence of which side was correct in the more like more executive power or less executive power, but it's definitely still a um, raging debate today. Another example is recently South Dakota has sued the national government because they denied a permit for a fireworks firework show at Mount Rushmore on July 4th. They've claimed that it was a arbitrary and capricious abuse of power. Also, the Federalists so argued that- fight. I'm sorry, go ahead. The Federalists also argued that even if the, they wanted the national government to have a little bit more power than the states, and they believed that it would stay in check by the checks and balances of the three um, branches. And Madison wrote about that in Federalist 51. Right. Um, I was wondering if you could um, elaborate a bit on the debate over the Bill of Rights. What were the arguments made by each side? The Federalists thought that the Constitution was enough to protect the rights, and the Anti-Federalists disagreed with them, saying that a Bill of Rights was needed to protect the rights of the people. And adding on to Miriam, also the Federalists thought that a strong national government was necessary and the Anti-Federalists believed that the national government was too far away from the people and believed that the president might become a monarch if that continued. And I think that ultimately history has proven that a Bill of Rights was needed as it's been influential in multiple case, court cases, Supreme Court and lower courts. Okay, so let's continue that conversation. Can you provide some ex specific examples about how influential the Bill of Rights has been? And why is that, why is whatever was decided significant? 
The 14th Amendment has been used in multiple cases such as Brown v. Board of Education and um, Obergefell v. Hodges to prove that all humans are equal and they deserve equal rights. And those have been some landmark cases that have changed the country. There's also perspective just right now that the Supreme Court is taking on, which I believe is about freedom of speech. It's called um, Mahoney Air School District versus Bernie Levy. And it was a high school cheerleader who said some of the same words outside of school, but it was referring to school and it could be seen in the coming months. It's about her getting kicked off the cheerleading squad and who's also suspended from school. And they're going, and the Supreme Court is going to rule on the protecting the protection of free speech in schools, which could possibly be a landmark court case. The Bill of Rights has influenced America in a bad way. For example, during Bowers v. Hardwick, the court ruled that the 14th Amendment didn't actually protect gay Americans. Although it was overruled in Lawrence v. Texas, it was still a landmark case for the queer community. Let, let me follow up on that. The examples that you have given um, deal with uh, school boards, uh, uh, local government, state government. Do you think that's what the anti-federalists were concerned about? Uh, that the, the local state and local governments would have too much power? I feel like they were more concerned about the national government having too much power in this because it was the national document and the federalists um, were certain that the national government needed more power and the anti-federalists um, wanted a bill of rights to protect the, protect the people from the national government. So I think it's more of a national government problem than a state government. You mentioned the necessary and proper clause. How has the necessary and proper clause been used in more recent applications? How has it been interpreted or used? But why don't we talk first about what the necessary and proper clause is specifically and what does, what does it, um, you know, kind of how, how did the founders interpret it? The necessary and proper cause is a cause that says that the, uh, um, Article One, Section Eight, um, it says to all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying out the execution of the foregoing powers. So it's basically just saying that the national government can has the power to create new laws if they deem it necessary and proper. And the founders wrote it in to in case any situation which they couldn't imagine at that time in history were to arise and there wasn't any prior legislation about it. Can you think of an example of today when uh, Congress or when the necessary and proper clause might come into play? Any kind of legislation or any kind of action on part of the government? I would say definitely COVID. Like the founders, a global pandemic, that is the way it looks like today. That was probably unimaginable. And I can see Biden, he the mask, national mask mandate ended, but if COVID had taken a turn for the worse, he might've used that clause to continue the national mask mandate. I think additionally, under the Trump administration, during the time where he declared a national emergency for the border wall, I think even that could be considered a use of the necessary and proper clause as it was intended to be one of the most important things to block illegal immigrants from entering the states.
you mentioned the, the 14th Amendment and equal protection. Uh, are there other parts of the 14th Amendment? I'll never get to know the answer to that. Thank you. <laughs> very good. Well, thank you very much for, for your presentation. Uh, starting off with the Dickens quote, which was an interesting way of, of framing this issue. And I, I very much like the point that you made that the, the Federalists were just trying to get something that would work. Uh, they, are, they, they wanted something that would pass. And uh, so they were willing to compromise on a variety of things. And that, I think, is, is one of the, uh, the things that you know about that is of relevance in today's discussion, that I didn't have time to ask you about it, but we often hear uh, discussions now where if someone is willing to compromise, they're sacrificing their principles. Well, as you argue, this is one of the most important debates that we've had in our nation's history uh, among people who were highly principled, but they wanted to get things done. They were practical uh, politicians uh, also. I. Uh, I think that uh, you, you were then able to talk about other examples other than the Bill of Rights, such as the executive branch and, and what position uh, people took. The one thing I would suggest to you, uh, when, when you're asked about examples of, of application or limits on uh, civil liberties that are placed um, in, in more contemporary times, you live in Indiana. There's this Tim's case that came out of Indiana. So, so pick on pick the uh, pick the local uh, cases that come out. This is the most recent example uh, of where the Bill of Rights has been applied to the state. Uh, so uh, take 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 the opportunity to say yes, and it's affected what goes on in our state too. Uh, but all in all, very good job. Very much enjoyed our discussion today. Yeah, I, I have to agree with uh, my colleague. I thought you really did an excellent job with your um, uh, prepared statement. Um, just from the outset, I really enjoyed the way that you presented it. There was a little bit of, you know, drama to it. There was, uh, you know, some enthusiasm in the way that uh, you articulated your points um, as it moved even throughout the different um, members of your team. So I just think in terms of your presentational style that I, I really, uh, that made it all that more enjoyable. I thought you did a really good job of talking about the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists and their positions. Um, and I thought that you went into, you know, some, some good detail in terms of, you know, kind of where they stood on, on these positions and mentioned uh, some of the key players in that. I like the fact that um, you talked about the Bill of Rights and also what's in the Bill of Rights to some extent. And I thought that was great. Um, and I liked the way that you concluded with the, the idea of the Constitution and the Bill, Bill of Rights as uh, building blocks of our society that still is effective today. And yet in the Q&A, you were able to talk about how it's still effective, but also some of the limitations on it. Um, I, I thought when you're talking about the executive power debate, for example, um, you not only talked about uh, the national level with uh, Biden uh, signing various executive orders and how that is an assertion of executive power. Uh, and then the, the um, South Dakota case about, um, you know, which shows the conflict over uh, having the fireworks at um, uh, Mount Rushmore. Um, and I, I also thought that your discussion of, um, you know, kind of some of the ways that the necessary and proper clause uh, come into play today, where you got into, um, you know, eventually the COVID and then the border wall situation too, kind of taking it back into um, the Trump administration. So overall, a really great job and I really enjoyed it. Yes, I agree with what my colleague said. Um, very delightful conversation. As you were an answering the follow-up questions, I was thinking of more questions and I was ready, but we ran out of time. Um, it was just really a pleasure speaking with you today and listening to all your knowledge. You're a very knowledgeable group and I enjoyed every minute of it.
Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.